Thank you for being here, everyone. Uh, really an honor and a pleasure to be with uh, such a great uh, diversified group. What I want to talk to you uh, about tonight is um, uh, principally uh, the evidence for God that is available to, to us today from contemporary science. I'm going to uh, address four points, uh, and I'll explain them as I kind of go along. Um, but uh, just as a precursor, what I'd like to say is this is about the best time you could be alive if you wanted to have evidence for God from physics, if you wanted to have evidence for God from science or from medicine. You couldn't live in a better era. And we'll talk about why that is in a moment. I want to concentrate tonight on things as uh, seemingly abstract as space-time geometry proofs for a creation, and for entropy evidence of a beginning of the universe, and for anthropic uh, coincidences that uh, indicate uh, God's intelligence and, and even supernatural design in the universe, and finally, near-death experiences, which seem to indicate that um, human self-consciousness will survive even bodily death. Is there a way that science has an avenue to get to all of these things? The answer is definitively yes, and we'll just quickly run through the evidence tonight, but there's so much more, there's so much more depth you could go into as we kind of um, uh, move into uh, these four areas. I'm just going to recommend a website to you, and uh, please uh, take advantage of it. There's all kinds of free video casts. There are high school curriculums you can get on this. There are uh, college uh, courses. There are uh, even things for, um, for college Newman centers and Catholic centers. There are uh, just a, a free encyclopedia, uh, which you can, you can get. And, and, and what's the website? Uh, it's www.magis, which is spelled M-A-G-I-S, reasonfaith.org. So if you know somebody who just desperately needs to hear this talk tonight, uh, this talk will also uh, we'll try and make it a free talk on the internet so that um, all of you will be able at least to, to uh, lead people to the talk if, uh, if they were not able to be here tonight, if you know someone who could really uh, use uh, hearing it. Well, let's get right down to it. I'm, I'm just going to approach the topic by first talking about the horizons and limits of science. Then I want to give you a little precursor on the Big Bang Theory. And then I want to talk about those four groups of evidence that I just men mentioned. Space-time geometry proofs for a beginning, entropy evidence of a beginning, anthropic coincidences indicating supernatural uh, design, and then finally near-death experiences indicating uh, the survival of human self-consciousness after bodily death. So what are the, the limits and the horizons of science? Can science disprove God? The answer, in a word, is no. It, it's not a possibility. You see, it's very difficult to disprove anything at all. Uh, if you were going to try and use scientific evidence, which has to be observational evidence, right, because science is based on experiments and, and measurements of the outside world which we observe. So science is based on observational evidence. It's very easy to prove something scientifically or observationally. All you have to do is see, see it once. So if you wanted to prove the existence of aliens, for example, by observational evidence, you only need to see one. However, try to disprove the existence of aliens with observational evidence. Why, you would actually have to visit every planet, know that you visited every single place that life could actually exist, make certain that the aliens didn't scurry away from you when you arrived at that planet, make sure that you absolutely knew that you had observed everything that there was to observe, and then notice that the aliens were not there. This is very difficult to do. So first of all, it's much harder to disprove things scientifically than to prove things scientifically. But now disproving God, that's twice as hard. Because remember, observational evidence comes from within our event horizon, 
and our event horizon is right here in this universe. But God, by definition, is outside of our universe. How in the world do you use evidence inside of our universe to disprove God who is outside of our universe? The answer is, you can't. It'll never work. It'll always be insufficient. That's like a cartoon character mustering all of the evidence that he can from inside the cartoon to disprove the existence of the cartoonist. It doesn't work. The idea then of science disproving God is really fallacious. It's not possible. And anyone who tells you that it is, you might want to say, I'm all, all ears. I'm very interested in hearing this proof. It doesn't exist. Number two, can a scientist say that he or she knows everything about the universe such that he knows or she knows that God didn't have to create it? Is that a possible statement in science? The answer is no. This is not a possible statement. This is not a, a possible uh, a truth in science. Scientists don't know whether they know everything about the universe or not because science is an inductive discipline. And an inductive discipline means you go from particular observations and then you generalize to theories, right, that put together all these particular observations. There's only one problem. You don't know, and no scientist knows, whether he or she has made all of the particular observations necessary to come up with a complete theory, a theory of everything about the universe. Scientists don't know that they haven't made all the particular observations because they can't know what they don't know until they've made the discovery of what they didn't know. So what's the problem? Anybody who says, we now know everything about the physical universe, we've made all the observations that are necessary to have a complete theory of everything physical, they're just simply exaggerating that claim right out of the universe. They have no such knowledge. It's not possible to attain, and the inductive nature of science prevents it from happening. That having been said, you might be asking yourself, well, Spitzer, if you say that science cannot disprove God, and science can't even know everything about the universe such that it can know that it doesn't need God, then how can you get off saying that there can be evidence for God from physics. How can you say there might be an evidence for a beginning, which could imply a creation, which could imply a creator from physics? How can you do that? Very simply, by getting some evidence from within our universe, which is possible to get. Namely, we can prove an intrinsic limit to past time. Now just hear me out for just a moment. I'm just going to talk about four things. Why would an intrinsic limit to past time prove a beginning of the universe, and that beginning of the universe prove, an, or at least imply in turn, um, a creation of the universe? Just four little steps. First thing. That intrinsic limit to past time, that's evidence from within our universe. So I'm going to just, all I have to prove is that such an, a limit to past time exists. If such a limit to past time exists, then what we're going to talk about is that means we can actually prove that there's a beginning of physical time. Now, physical time must condition all of physical reality. So if physical time didn't exist prior to the beginning, and physical reality couldn't have existed prior to the beginning because wherever there's physical reality, there's got to be physical time. And if there isn't any physical time, then there isn't any physical reality. We'll talk about 
the beginning of physical time in just a moment. Now, if physical reality didn't exist before the beginning, then what was physical reality before the beginning? Nothing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nothing is a very good word to describe it. The whole of physical reality was nothing. And by the way, that even includes if the universe were in a multiverse or the universe were actually existing in the higher dimensional space of string theory. I mean, basically, if physical time doesn't exist, I don't care if it's a multiverse and higher dimensional space of string theory. Uh, I don't care if it's just our plain old universe. Physical reality was nothing prior to that beginning. Now, what do we know about nothing? Nothing. Thank you. That's exactly right, because nothing is nothing. We don't want to sneak something into nothing. Nothing is not empty space. Empty space is dimensional. It's orientable. You can have more or less of empty space, but you really can't have more or less of nothing because it's nothing. Thank you. You got it. The same thing with, can nothing be a low energy threshold of a quantum field? No, because even if you have a zero energy threshold of a quantum field, quite frankly, you still have a quantum field which is Something, and not nothing. So nothing is nothing. That's what we know. Now, third step. What can nothing do? Nothing. Because it's nothing. From nothing, say the philosophers, only nothing can come. Because it's nothing. Zero just keeps generating zeros, it doesn't poof, go to one. Now, that having been said, if the only thing nothing can do is nothing, let us move to our fourth step. And what is that? Well, when the universe or all physical reality was nothing, and it could only do nothing, then it could never have moved itself from nothing to something. Because the only thing it could have done when it was nothing is nothing. Conclusion. Well, if the universe could not have moved, or the multiverse or physical reality could not have moved itself from nothing to something when it was nothing, then something else would have had to have moved it from nothing to something because we know one thing, nothing didn't do it. And that something else would have to be transcendent, that is to say, outside of our universe. Let's just call that for a moment a creator, a transcendent creator, or God. Now you see the importance of establishing that intrinsic limit to pastime in our universe. If you establish a true beginning to past time, prior to which the universe or a multiverse or physical reality would have to be nothing, then you are essentially establishing a condition when physical reality could not have moved itself from nothing to something by itself. Therefore, something else had to move it from nothing to something. And that, that other thing must be transcendent. Let's call it a creator. Everybody okay so far? Sort of see it? Sort of? Sure, okay. Now, can you actually get physical evidence for a beginning? Before I tell that story, I just want to give a few definitions of terms and a little history about the Big Bang Theory, and then we can go right to it. Here's a few factoids just to keep your, your uh, eyes fixed on. Prior to 1927, a lot of physicists, probably the vast majority of physicists, believed that it was possible for the universe to go back infinitely in time. Some physicists believed because of their religion that it did not, but physically it was permissible for time to extend backwards 
infinitely. There is an exception to this called the Kalam argument or a Helbertian argument in mathematics that we're not going to talk about tonight. But the key thing to remember is that was the general thinking. The, the, the thing that we want to remember is that in 1927, a Belgian priest by the name of Father Georges Lemaitre came along. And this Belgian priest went to MIT. He did receive a doctorate in, in uh, physical cosmology and then became a colleague of Einstein's. And, and, and Lemaitre, I'm not going to get into the, the problem that he was solving, but the problem was basically the recessional velocities of extragalactic nebulae. And in order to solve that problem, Lemaitre, this priest, ingeniously took the general theory of relativity and showed that space and time can stretch. So it's no need, right, for, uh, you know, the, to, uh, for us to think about the universe as kind of uh, having things moving into a pre-existent space. The universe literally has these galaxies and the space between the galaxies is stretching and growing, sort of like a balloon. And of course, if you put dots on the balloon and you keep blowing up the balloon, you get more elastic between the dots. And what's happening to all the dots? They're all moving away from each other because the elastic between them is stretching and growing. Well, space-time is a field just like that. It can actually stretch, it can grow, it can change its coordinate structure according to the density of mass energy in it. It's a most remarkable thing. And Lemaitre figures, <clears throat> if space-time grows, that he can actually explain the recessional velocities of these extragalactic nebulae. They're going too fast. <clears throat> but if you think about it for just a moment, then the further something is from you, if it's not moving away in pre-existent space, but instead the space is growing between the galaxies, you can see how the further galaxy would move away from you faster than the nearer galaxy. I mean, just think of it this way. Take out a, a rubber band when you go home and put the rubber band on a ruler and, and then put a dot at zero next to your left thumb. Then put a dot on the rubber band at one, and another dot at, on the rubber band at two inches. Okay? Now put your thumb on the dot that's at two inches and stretch it to four inches. So it grows two inches. You with me? How far did the dot that was at one move? It moved to where? To two. So it only grew one inch. So when the further dot moved two inches, the middle dot, the, the, the one at one, only moved one inch. Why? Because there was more rubber band to stretch. Remember, the space is growing. The rubber band between the dots is growing. And so Lemaitre had the explanation for why it is the case that the further away a galaxy is or a nebula is, the faster it's moving away from me. Because the space is growing, they're not moving in fixed space. Of course, Einstein looks at this and he looks at Lemaitre and he goes, the mathematics is perfect, right? It is the case that the recessional velocity is equal to the Hubble constant or the Lemaitre constant times the distance from me. There's no question, it's directly proportional. But, he said, the physics is preposterous, growing space in an expanding universe. Well, a few years later, Edwin Hubble proved him to be absolutely correct. In his survey of the universe, he showed that the red shifts of all the, the recession, uh, which indicate the recessional velocities of the galaxies, actually corresponded precisely to Lemaitre's formula and to Lemaitre's theory. He revised the constant, and it became the Hubble constant, and today we know the, well, the equation V, which is recessional velocity, equals H, which is the Hubble constant, times D, which is the distance from us. He was right. Well, what's this got to do with anything? A lot in a moment. But what it meant is the universe probably started as a little speck 
maybe 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, or even smaller, a long time ago, and then all of a sudden space started to stretch and grow. And of course, we're going to talk about dark energy in a moment, and the dark energy is causing it to stretch and grow. And then finally, of course, it's gotten to the place where it is today, the space continuing to stretch and grow because of the dark energy in it. And for all intents and purposes, it seems as if if we roll the projector backwards, if we go backwards into time, it seems that eventually it would have to come down to a single point approximately 13.7 billion years ago when the so-called Big Bang actually occurred. Well, what do we know of our universe? By the, by the way, Edwin Hubble verified the theory with the redshifts. Penzias and Wilson uh, further verified it by discovering the 2.7 degree Kelvin uniformly distributed radiation, the so-called uh, microwave background radiation, the remnant of the Big Bang, which correspond precisely to the temperature that would have been required of a 13.7 billion year old universe for all intents and purposes. We at least had, starting in 1927, the very real possibility that the universe began at a single point and expanded until, until its, its current condition today. What is the current condition? Well, we probably have somewhere in the neighborhood of about 4.6 visible matter, 4.6% visible matter. Visible matter, you know, absorbs energy, it emits energy, electromagnetic radiation, luminescent radiation, right? Only 4.6% is visible matter that can do something and make electrical lights work and suns can burn and so forth and so on. 23% is dark matter. Dark matter comes in very, very small refined particles, at least we think so, probably passing through our bodies right now, but it doesn't absorb or emit uh, radiation. It doesn't absorb or emit light. So we really can't see it. We don't know it except by its gravitational effects. That's why, by the way, galaxies don't fly apart because of dark energy. And then the vast majority of energy in our universe is dark energy. Dark energy is very different from dark matter. And 72.4% of the um, matter energy in our universe is dark energy. And dark energy might be likened to a field which is attaching itself to the space-time field, which causes the space-time field to stretch and grow at an accelerated rate. So just as mat visible matter and dark matter cause the space-time field to collapse, giving rise to an attraction effect, Dark energy has the reverse effect. It attaches itself to the space-time field and causes the space-time field to stretch and grow in an accelerated rate. It has a repulsive effect. Well, that's what you need to know typically. And within visible matter, we, we have four major forces, right? The electromagnetic force causing right, all this electromagnetic activity, You're running the tape recorders and running the cameras and running the lights and so forth and so on. And furthermore, we have the uh, strong nuclear force. Strong nuclear force binds the protons together uh, in the nucleus of an atom. So that's how you get uh, a helium atom having two protons, right? Uh, you, you essentially uh, have a stronger force that overcomes the, the, the repulsion force of the two uh, like charged particles, the two protons, right? Typically, they should fly apart. But in point of fact, they're not flying apart. They're bound together by a force which is stronger than the electromagnetic force called the strong nuclear force. Then we have the weak force, which causes radiation, particle decay. And finally, of course, the gravitational force, which is com completely explained by the effects of, of the space-time field. But too much for tonight. <laughs> What's my point? It's a really nifty universe out there, but there's probably in our observable universe Oh, approximately 10 to the 55 kilograms worth of visible matter. That 10 to the 55 kilograms is broke. You can break it down into about 10 to the 80 baryons. You can figure out what the dark matter and the dark energy would be proportionate to it. You can probably say that there are 10 to the 22 stars out there and 10 to the 11th galaxies. And that's our universe. And the question that emerges 
And the singular question of importance to us tonight is was the Big Bang 13.7 billion years ago really the beginning of our universe? Is that really the intrinsic limit to past time? Or could there have been some other condition prior to the Big Bang in which our universe could have been which would have allowed it to have existed infinitely or eternally into the past? That's the question. Was the Big Bang the beginning? Or was there a previous period? And if there was a previous period, would that have to have had a beginning? Well, we have three major theories to talk about. I'm just going to go through them very, very quickly. But the key thing is all of those other possibilities will also have to have a beginning. What's one possibility? The so-called um, you know, a multiverse, right? And a multiverse is like a big mega universe. And it's coughing out, as it were, little bubble universes all the time. One of those little bubble universes is our universe. Um, it's trillions upon trillions upon trillions of other universes emerging from the false vacuum caused by uh, you know, the, 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 the fields uh, intrinsic to the multiverse. Is that a possibility with inflationary theory and string theory? Yes, it's a possibility. Do we have any proof for a multiverse? No, we don't have any proof. It's completely hypothetical, but it's a possibility, and we ought to consider that. Because if our universe is just one little bubble universe in a multiverse, well, maybe the multiverse can go back infinitely in time. Can it? As we'll see in a moment, it can't. You can actually get a proof that even a multiverse needs a beginning. There's a second theory called the so-called bouncing universe or the oscillating universe, right? In this particular case, our universe would be kind of expanding, and then one day it would have come to a halt, and then it would have collapsed into a, in upon itself in a big crunch, and then had a bounce, and then it would have bounced back again and started expanding, and theoretically, you could have expansions followed by contractions, followed by re-expansions, followed by recontractions, and you could maybe go back ad infinitum. And, and maybe, if all those bounces were occurring in the higher dimensional space of string theory, why maybe you wouldn't even have to answer all the problems of the traditional bouncing theory. By the way, the bouncing universe theory has fallen into big, huge problems, and we'll talk about them a little bit later. But the key thing is, is Maybe in higher dimensional space you can, you can allow the universe to bounce and get out of all the problems with the traditional bouncing universe. The answer is no, you really can't. Those bouncing universes, they're going to have to have a beginning too. Well, now what? Well, basically, could you just have a static state for our universe to be in for an infinite amount of time and then suddenly, poof, it starts to expand in the Big Bang? So it was really around for an infinite amount of, of time, and then one day, boom, it, it explodes. Actually, you can't have that either. No matter where you turn, you're going to have to have a beginning. Now, what I'd like you to do is, if you're really interested in looking at the mathematics behind all the proofs I'm going to be talking about tonight, I want you to go to our website, www.modestreasonfaith.org. We have Dr. Alexander Valenkin's lectures at Cambridge University during Stephen Hawking's birthday party last year. We have all, kind, all kinds of different things uh, on there. Uh, you can read the actual articles by Board of Valenkin and Guth and so forth for these things. You can actually get the mathematics for it. I'm going to reduce it to kind of some simple logical steps, and then uh, I think you can basically understand it. Well... Why does our universe, a multiverse, a bouncing universe, and why do they all need a beginning? Let's go to our first kind of evidence, space-time geometry proofs. I'm not going to explain them in total tonight, but you already know that space-time can stretch and grow. And it has very dynamic properties when it stretches and grows. And because of these properties, you can actually assemble proofs like a five-condition proof, wherein if all five conditions would hold, for example, and they were true for our universe or true for a multiverse, why, you would actually have to have a beginning. 
Now, this process started back in 1993. Well, actually, it goes all the way back to 1968 with the singularity theorems. But the singularity theorems did not consider dark energy. That was a much more recent discovery. But the post-dark energy space-time geometry proofs start in 1993 with two physicists, Arvind Borda, an Indian physicist, who is now at the Cavalier Institute at the University of California, Santa Barbara, just up the road there. And the second is Dr. Alexander Volenkin, who is the director of cosmology at the Institute of, uh, uh, of Cosmology at uh, Tufts University in Boston. So these two uh, physicists got together, very bright physicists, I might add. They got together, and they basically forwarded a proof in 1993 that had five conditions. For, it, it, it encompassed dark energy, inflationary universe, etc. And basically, they showed that if any universe or multiverse were to meet these five conditions, that universe or multiverse would have to have a beginning. You could not continue past time you know, to a, a point beyond that beginning. And that would be a beginning of physical reality. And even if it were a multiverse, it would also have to apply if those five conditions held. In 1997, they discovered a possible exception a little loophole to their proof in the third condition of the proof, which was called the weak energy condition. And uh, it was a very, very remote possibility that could apply to our universe or a multiverse in which our universe could be embedded. But essentially, it was so remote a possibility, so highly, highly, highly improbable, that Dr. Alan Guth uh, later said that he still considered the 1993 proof to be quite valid and he considered the loophole that Borda and Vilenkin had discovered in their own proof to be unimportant. But nevertheless, it was a loophole. And nevertheless, it meant that further work had to be done if we really wanted to prove the beginning of a universe or a multiverse. In 1999, uh, this other fellow, Dr. Alan Guth, that I just mentioned, uh, he has the uh, chair of cosmology at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And he came together, and by the way, he's the father of inflationary theory. This guy is one of the, the brightest physicists in the world today, for sure. And, and of course, he gets together with these other two physicists, Alexander Vilenkin and Arvind Borda, and they begin collectively to look at another kind of proof. But before he does it, in 1999, he sets out to test all the various models for inflationary universes or multiverses, right? And, and this is what he discovers. He says, try as scientists might, or physicists might, to try and develop a model of an inflationary multi uh, universe or multiverse that could proceed eternally into the past. They have been unable to do so. All such models can be eternal into the future, but none of them can be eternal into the past. They must all have a beginning publishes this in physical review letters, right? And so the world is getting, ooh, you're getting, starting to get shaken up again. But then the three physicists come together and they develop a proof in 2003 called, not surprisingly, the borda guth theorem or the borda guth proof, right? Proof and theorem, essentially the same. Okay, the theorem is not a theory, right? A theorem is like a proof. A theory is like a, an explanation of a lot of data in a comprehensive model. Okay. The key thing is, in the, the so-called BVG proof, right, the Board of Lincoln Guth proof, there's only one condition. And this is highly, highly relevant. There's only one condition in order to make the proof. Not five conditions, but only one. And this makes it very difficult to disprove. And the second thing is, the proof works independent of the physics of any particular universe or multiverse. So it doesn't matter whether the general theory of relativity applies. It doesn't matter whether Einstein's gravitational equations apply. It's simply the, the physics of the universe doesn't matter at all. And we'll see why in just a moment. How does this proof work? One condition, the physics of the universe or multiverse is really essentially irrelevant? How does a proof work? Let me just try and explain it in five little steps, if I might. 
Let's go back to that rubber band example on the ruler and, and Georges Lemaitre and the essential insight. Do you remember what we were saying? That the further the dot is from me, the more space there is to expand. And so when space expands uniformly, like the rubber band stretching to four inches, or the balloon being blown up, or the universe uniformly expanding, the more space you have, the more you would expect the recessional velocity to go up because you're going to have more expansion per unit time on the dot that's further away. Remember, the dot, when we stretched it to four from two, the dot, which is at one, only went to two. One inch of growth versus two inches of growth because twice as much rubber band, twice as much space grew. You sort of get it a little bit? The further the distance, the greater the recessional velocity. But it's not just the further the distance. What Board of Lincoln and Guth dis discovered, it was there all along, of course, is that as we move into the future, remember, the universe is expanding, right? So as you go into the future, what's distance doing between particles, between galaxies? Yeah, it's getting larger and larger. Thank you. So space or distance is getting bigger into the future. So we could also make another conclusion. The further and further and further we go into the future, and the greater and greater distance between the galaxies, the greater the recessional velocity of the galaxies must be from one another because there's more space in the future to grow. You sort of with me? So the further we go into the future, the greater the recessional velocities, the more things, the faster things are moving away from everything else. So far, so good? Now, let's say you have a rocket ship, step three. And the rocket ship is trying to get to our nearer galaxy. Okay? Let's suppose the rocket ship is moving at 100,000 miles per hour. And let's suppose the near galaxy, like the dot at one inch, let's suppose it's moving away from me at 25,000 miles per hour. I'm going to teach you a new concept called relative velocity. Relative velocity is the velocity of the rocket ship leaving our galaxy minus the recessional velocity right, of the galaxy it's, it's, it's going towards. Remember, the, it's like you know, your father swimming away from you, right? As you were a little kid, you're learning how to swim, and your dad keeps moving backwards. It's, it's the velocity of the swimmer minus the velocity backwards of the dad, right? That's the true velocity. So, if the, if the galaxy is going away at 25,000 miles per hour, and the rocket ship left our galaxy at 100,000 miles per hour, what's the relative velocity of the rocket ship? 75,000, thank you. But now let's go to the more distant galaxy. Remember, its, it's recessional velocity is, is twice as much, okay? So it's moving away from the rocket ship at 50,000 miles per hour. So if you had observers that were sitting there on the more distant galaxy and they were looking at this rocket ship coming, what would they see the rocket ship's velocity, relative velocity to be? Only 50,000 miles per hour. 100,000 minus 50,000 equals 50,000. You guys with me? Okay. So relative velocities are always going to be slowing down. Recessional velocities are always going to be increasing into the future. So as we go into the future now, and recessional velocities, we just said we're getting faster and faster into the future, what are happening to the relative velocities of projectiles like rocket ships that are trying to reach other things between galaxies? They're getting slower and slower into the future. You guys, are you getting there? You're getting there. Okay, step four. If the relative velocity of projectiles like rocket ships are getting slower into the future, let's go into the past now. What was the relative velocity of things like rocket ships, projectiles, as we move further and further back into the past? 
Anybody? They must have been faster. Thank you. Okay, so they're getting faster and faster and faster as you go into the past, right? Because the recessional velocities are slower and slower and slower. The recessional velo uh, the relative velocities have got to be getting faster and faster and faster. You still with me? Last step. Eventually, you're going to get back into the past where every single projectile has a relative velocity that's the speed of light arbitrarily close to the speed of light. The speed of light is the highest attainable velocity for the movement of mass energy in the universe. You guys with me? Once all those relative velocities have reached 300,000 kilometers per second or 186,200 miles per second, can you go back even one microsecond further into the past, into time? No. It is a beginning. Ooh. You mean you can't go? No, the universe could not have existed prior to that moment. Wow. Now just think about it for a moment. You might say, Spencer, what if scientists discover a tachyon which could travel faster than the speed of light? What then? If that were the case, well, would that invalidate the proof? No. Whatever that velocity of that tachyon is, pick it, choose it. Maybe it's 500,000 kilometers per second. Fine. You're going to go back into the past for a finite proper time, and guess what you're going to reach in a finite proper time? 500,000 miles per second of the tachyon, exactly. And then what? Boom, you hit the beginning, exactly. But you might say to yourself, hey, wait a minute. Does every single universe or multiverse, are they always going to need an upper limit to velocity? I mean, does there always have to be an upper limit to velocity in every universe and multiverse? Yes, alas, yes. Because if you didn't have an upper limit to the transmission of physical energy in the universe, guess what? That would mean that everything could travel at an infinite velocity. You with me? And if everything could travel, or at least some things could travel at an infinite velocity, why, they would be everywhere simultaneously. You with me? But if all kinds of different things, like protons and electrons, could occupy every single space-time point, they'd be everywhere simultaneously, then you'd have proton-electrons. You'd have contradictions at every single solitary point in our universe. That's bad. You can't have that. Therefore, you better have an upper limit to the transmission of physical energy in any universe or multiverse. Whoa. Let me examine the, con the, the, the conditions for this and, and the conclusions for this. Point number one. Please notice you only have one condition for this proof. The technical way of referring to it is that the average Hubble expansion be greater than zero no matter how small. So all you need is essentially a rate of expansion in your universe greater than zero. Well, does that apply to our universe? Yep. Does that have to apply to every single multiverse that exists? Yep. Why? Because multiverses have to be inflationary. You have to have dark energy causing inflation. It's the only way you can have a multiverse. In other, does, do inflationary multiverses, do they have to have an expansion rate greater than zero? Hello, of course. I mean, does this apply to bouncing universes too? Absolutely. Does it apply to bouncing universes in the higher dimensional space of string theory? Yes. If you read the Board of Lincoln and Guth article, the 2003 proof in Physical Review Letters D, you will see very clearly that it has to apply even to bouncing universes in the higher dimensional, uh, uh, in the higher dimensional uh, space of string theory. Oh, what are you saying, Spitzer? Every universal, multiversal, bouncing universe condition, every single one of them has to have a beginning independently of the physics of the universe. And there's only one condition, so it's really, really hard to disprove. And it's independent of the physics of the universe, so it can apply to any universe or multiverse that we would like? Yes. Yike. What does this mean? Well, 
It means you'd have to have a beginning of our universe, and if our universe were embedded in a multiverse, that multiverse would have to have a beginning. And let's suppose we get extravagant and we say that our multiverse is in a multiverse of multiverses. That too would have to have a beginning because it would have to be inflationary and its expansion rate would have to be greater than zero. Well, what are you saying? Eventually, you will have to get to the end of beginnings of beginnings. And when you do, let's call that an absolute beginning of physical reality. And that's an absolute beginning of physical time, which is, of course, as we just said, an absolute beginning of physical reality. And what happens prior to the beginning of physical reality, I don't care if it's a multiverse, if it's in a multiverse of multiverses, bouncing universes in higher dimensional space and strength theory, what happens when you get to the absolute beginning of physical reality? Physical reality is nothing prior to the beginning. If it's nothing prior to the beginning, what can it do? Nothing. And therefore, can it move itself from nothing to something when it's nothing? No. And therefore, something else will have to do it. And it looks like we are confronting or coming very close to a transcendent creative entity. And that, that we might call God. Let's get to the second piece of evidence. Fascinating though, isn't it? Second piece of evidence, let's just call it entropy. I'm just gonna do this in five little steps again for you, just so you can kind of get the idea of, of what's going on. Basically, entropy is a measurement of disorder within a physical system. It's a measurement of disorder within a physical system. And of course, if the entropy is increasing, that means disorder in the system is increasing. Are you, are you sort of with me? Now here's the one thing you want to remember, step one. Any physical system, if it's going to do some useful work, it has to have some ordering in that physical system. That physical system must be kind of like finely packed. It's got to be ordered in such a way so that it can actually do something. So just think in step one in your mind, if I'm gonna have some useful work, I'm gonna to have to have some order in the physical system which, I'm, I'm, which is, is causing this work, okay? Pure disorder in a system, pure randomness in a system will not produce any useful work at all. It will be like cosmic microwave background radiation just sitting there, randomly distributed, a micro, 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 micro degree above absolute zero Kelvin. That's not useful. Okay, first step, you want useful work, you need some order in your physical system. Second step, this is in fact the case. Every time a physical system produces useful work, a slight amount of disorder is going to occur in that system. So the production of physical work actually causes a slight increase in disorder, a slight increase in entropy in that system. So we're going to have a slight movement from order to disorder every time some work is performed by the physical system. Still hanging in there with me? Step three. This is an irreversible process. Why? Because the odds, the probability of disorder or randomness is always far, far greater than the probability of order. That is to say, of organization within the system, which organization can produce useful work. So the probabilities always favor randomness, always favor disorder rather than order. So as useful work continues and the order of the system moves slightly more to, toward disorder, it's not going to reverse itself and go from disorder back to order again. Just, just think of some pool balls finely racked in a triangular configuration. You hit the cue ball and bam! The balls are scattered randomly all over the table, and basically you go, big a deal. 
It's nothing. We expect this, right? It moved from order to disorder, and we didn't think anything of it. But boy, if you hit that cue ball, which hit the 10 ball, which hit the 8 ball, which hit the 7 ball, and then suddenly, and it reconfigures itself triangularly and spits the cue ball out at the end, you go, whoa, that's highly improbable. <laughs> you would take note of that. You would think, wow, I don't think that's ever going to happen again. And you would be right. It's highly, highly, highly Highly improbable. Well, in the same way, in our third step, we do not expect a physical system which is gradually increased in disorder to suddenly, randomly, and spontaneously move back to order because the probability of the order is so much less than the probability of the disorder. You with me? Fourth step. Let's now consider the universe as a whole to be an isolated physical system. What's an isolated physical system? A system where you don't have some kind of a pump or some kind of an electrical impulse coming to it from the outside, which could put some more order, put some more um, uh, order to the, uh, the physical system back into the system. An isolated physical system just all by itself, okay? Nothing outside it to put order back into it, like a refrigerator or a pump or something of that nature. Now, that being the case, if the universe were an isolated physical system, and we suppose that our universe is all there is unless there is a multiverse, then just say if the multiverse is an isolated system, then what would we expect? We would expect that the universe, because it's doing useful work, right? The stars are burning, the planets are growing things, physicists are thinking about it, work is being done, we're moving progressively from order to disorder, the entropy is increasing, the disorder is increasing, in the physical system, the universe, it's irreversible according to step three. So as the universe, let's suppose the universe existed for an infinite amount of time. And it really was an isolated system. And it really was doing work as long as it could do work for an infinite amount of time, progressively moving to greater and greater disorder. What would we expect the universe to be today? At, yeah, somebody said, maximum disorder, or another way of saying that is maximum entropy. Exactly. And what's maximum entropy? Why? That's just like our microwave background radiation, right? Our cosmic microwave background radiation. Just a fraction, 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 fraction of a degree above absolute zero degrees Kelvin. Doing nothing. Uh-oh. But that, in point of fact, our fifth step, that, in point of fact, is not the case. As it so happens, the universe is at a very low entropy. The cosmic microwave background radiation may be 100 times greater than the, uh, the, the useful energy within the system, but for all intents and purposes, we have a low entropy, plenty of order left, plenty of stars burning, plenty of plants, plants growing on planet, plenty of physicists thinking about it. We are not anywhere close to maximum entropy. What must be our conclusion? If the universe is an isolated system, then for all intents and purposes, ladies and gentlemen, and everything I just said about thermodynamics is true, which, by the way, is based not only on thermodynamic evidence, but on statistical evidence. What I said about entropy is true. Then our universe hasn't been around for an infinite amount of time. I can assure you of this. And by the way, a lot of people thought that the bouncing universe might permit an entropy restart. Right? In other words, so the universe er, comes to a stop, but that's probably not going to happen because the dark energy in our universe right, you know, is, is so high, right? Over 72% you know, of our universe is dark energy, which is causing this repulsion. The universe is probably not even going to bounce once for all intents and purposes. As far as we can see, if the dark energy was always here in the universe, and we suppose that it is, for all intents and purposes, the universe isn't going to bounce anyway. 
But at one time that was proposed, you know, maybe a, in a universal collapse, the entropy could actually restart again, and, and we could go back to low entropy, and then, you know, we'd have a, another chance. But nah, the, what Jacob Beckenstein discovered is entropy actually proceeds not only in black holes, but in universal collapses. Penrose and Beckenstein discovered that the entropy would increase by a factor of 10 to the 80th as the universe collapsed toward a black hole or, or toward a bounce. This is not going to make for a good restart. In short, the entropy evidence shows precisely what our space-time geometry proof, our Board of Lincoln and Guth theorem just showed. He's, he's still hanging in there with me? A beginning of the universe is very, very likely. You know what Albert Einstein said about the, the theory of entropy, though, the second law of thermodynamics? He said, if all of physics changes, that the general theory of relativity is completely altered, one thing will still stand. The law, the second law of thermodynamics, entropy, because it's based on statistical evidence and not just on physical and thermodynamic properties. Yes, the flow from order to disorder is a matter of probabilities and not just physics. Whoa, so now we have two vastly applicable evidence sets for a beginning. And indeed, an absolute beginning to physical reality, even if that were in a multiverse or a bouncing universe. Well, now what? Well, is there any other evidence that we could consider? And the answer is yes. There's a third set of evidence. Let's call it anthropic coincidences. What's an anthropic coincidence? It's a highly, 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 highly improbable event, which is absolutely necessary for the development of any life form within our universe. You with me? So, what are such highly, highly, highly improbable events? There are two kinds, the initial conditions of the universe and the universal constants. Let's talk about both of them because I think you will appreciate what it is pointing to about the nature of this creation that's, and this creator that's implied by the evidence for a beginning. For example, low entropy, as we just saw, which means high order in the physical systems, Low entropy is required in order for life forms to develop. Why? You need to have energy which can do some useful work. If you don't have energy that can do useful work, life forms will not develop, let alone flourish and evolve. So we need low entropy in our universe. But remember, is low entropy highly improbable? Is high order highly improbable compared to random, low order disorganization? Yes. So, Roger Penrose actually calculated what the odds would be of our universe's low entropy occurring by pure chance. Remember, we need that low energy for life forms to develop. Do you know what the figure is? Do you know the odds against low entropy? Remember, low entropy, high order is against the odds. It's highly improbable. Here's how improbable our low entropy is. It's 10 raised to the 10 raised to the 123 to 1 against. That's a double exponent, everyone. If you were to reduce that to a single exponent, it would be a 10 and then in the single exponent, a 1 with 123 zeros after it. The exponent would be a trillion, 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 trillion. Now, if you were to write that number out with every zero being 10 point type, our solar system could not hold that number. It's a big number. This number is like the odds of a monkey typing Shakespeare by random tapping of the keys on the typewriter. You sternly order the monkey, type the works of Shakespeare, 
and the monkey begins. He begins, you know, randomly typing on the typewriter, and you come in, you feed him every now and again, and he's furiously typing away randomly on the key. And then, lo and behold, there's Macbeth, and then the Hamlet, and Richard III in perfect condition. You go, oh my gosh, this is highly improbable. A flawless rendition of Shakespeare by random tapping of the keys. And you would be right. It's highly improbable. Indeed, 10 raised to the 10 raised to the 123 is so improbable, we call it virtually impossible. This isn't going to occur by pure chance. But hang in there with me for a bit. If that's the case, and we can't find a single natural cause for why this low entropy would have occurred at the Big Bang. In other words, it was just a shot in the random dark that this low entropy occurred. Then I ask you, how in the world did we get all of the fine-tuning and ordering necessary for the low entropy of our universe at the Big Bang by pure chance? Maybe somebody helped the monkey with the Shakespeare. <laughs> Maybe somebody helped the universe with the low entropy. But it gets better. We have these things called universal constants. And I know I only have about 10 minutes left here with you, and I just, but I, I want to just get to these constants for a moment because I think they're important. A constant is a number. It's like a limit or a parameter. And these numbers, which represent limits and parameters, minimums and maximums and so forth, these numbers actually not only control the equations of physics, because they control the equations of physics, which describe the laws of nature, these numbers, these parameters, these limits are actually controlling the laws of nature themselves. We have about 20 constants, and they're controlling everything. Remember the four forces I was just talking about? The electromagnetic force, the strong nuclear force, the weak force, and the gravitational force? They all have constants. For example, the electromagnetic force has the mass of the proton, and the mass of the electron, and the electromagnetic uh, uh, charge. That's three constants. A and then the weak uh, uh, force has the weak force constant. The strong nuclear force has the strong nuclear force coupling constant. The gravitational force has the gravitational constant. We just talked about Hubble's constant, right, that transforms, uh, you know, the distance from me into the... Uh, uh, the recessional velocity, that's Hubble's constant. The rate of expansion of the universe as a whole, right? That, that space is stretching and growing. Uh, we talked about the speed of light constant. 300,000 kilometers per second, 186,200 miles per second, representing the highest possible velocity in the universe. Is everybody sort of with me? Now here's the deal with these numbers. Just memorize these two thoughts. First, those constants could have been almost anything at the Big Bang. They didn't have to have the values that they have. They could have been anything higher or lower, virtually anything higher or lower, within certain parameters. Number two, you need these constants to be exactly what they are in a very, very narrow window in order for any life form to be possible at all. You still hanging in there with me? Number one, they could have been anything, any value, but in point of fact, they have exactly the values that they need to have for a life form to develop within a very, very narrow window. Let me just give you three examples. You'll get it. There's a lot of them. You can read them in my book, New Proofs for the Existence of God, Contributions to Contemporary Physics and Philosophy. You can read a whole bunch of them. But let me just give you one. If you altered the gravitational constant or the weak force constant, by one part in 10 to the 50, higher or lower. One part in 10 to the 50. That's like a decimal point, 49 zeros, and a one. You with me? Really small fraction. Higher or lower from their values. Either the universe would have been continuously exploding in its expansion, which is very bad for life forms, incinerating everything, right? or the universe would have collapsed into a black hole, crushing everything into 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, 
which is very bad for life forms. You mean we narrowly escaped complete disaster, the impossibility of any life form whatsoever by one part in 10 to the 50, higher or lower in these two constants, the gravitational force constant and the weak force constant? Yep, we did. You really believe this happened by pure chance? A single one-off shot at the Big Bang? I mean, do I have a bridge to sell you? Just kidding. There's an explanation, possible multiverse, get to it. Number two, it's another example. If you altered one of the following four constants by just a fraction, higher or lower than their current values, the mass of the proton, the mass of the electron, the electromagnetic charge, or the gravitational constant, alter just a slight little bit higher or lower, then every star in our universe would either be a blue giant or every star in our universe would be a red dwarf. If every star in our universe were a blue giant, it would incinerate absolutely everything. This is very bad for life forms. If every star in our universe were a red dwarf, there would not be enough electromagnetic luminescent or heat energy to do anything. Everything would have frozen. You mean one little fraction off in these four constants and everything either fries or everything is frozen? That's right. Wow, we must be really, really lucky. We hit it straight on. Or maybe someone helped the monkey with the Shakespeare. Let's take the strong nuclear force coupling constant. If you just raise that 2%, there's no hydrogen in the universe. That means no nuclear fuel for the sun, no water, bad for life forms. Alternatively, lower it 2% from its value, and you'll have no element heavier than hydrogen, like carbon. Very bad for life forms. Can't make a life form out of pure hydrogen. You mean we hit it straight on again? Strong nuclear force constant, weak force constant, gravitational constant, mass of the proton, mass of the electron, electromagnetic charge, low entropy, 10 now raised to the 10, skip the 123, we're up to 125. 10 to the 10 to the 125. How are you going to explain this? No physicist believes, I can tell you this right now, no physicist believes that this occurred by pure chance in a one-off, that means one time only, try. At the Big Bang, boom, it happened and we lucked out. First try. So there are two basic explanations, both of which can be called metaphysical. The first, of course, is the one to which I'm going to, to, to allude to in a moment, namely supernatural design. Something really, really, really smart set the values of those constants. The other one is called the multiverse hypothesis, which is favored by Stephen Hawking and others. Essentially, the idea with the multiverse, remember, is a multiverse is a mega universe which is coughing out all kinds of little bubble universes. Hanging in there with me? So every time you cough out a bubble universe like ours, you get another, as it were, roll of the dice. Again and again, you can reset the constants and reset the constants every single time a bubble universe. And maybe if you had a multiverse that was lasted long enough, you could cough out 10 to the 10 to the 125th bubble universes. Now, it'd have to last a really long time in order to do it, but maybe you could. Now, of course, this is getting very fanciful because at this point, you have to postulate 10 to the 10 to the 125th universes merely to explain just one, ours, which is like bringing excess baggage to cosmic extremes, but preclude from that for a moment. Is there any problem with that multiverse hypothesis that would even want to make us think that supernatural explanation is a, a, a possibly a, a better explanation? And the answer is, yeah. Multiverses need fine-tuning, too. 
they need the same fine-tuning in their constants. They will also have to have some kind of low entropy at the beginning. In other words, if you have a multiverse and it doesn't have particular fine-tuning in its initial conditions, then they will sporadically, the multiverse will sporadically, you know, cough out bubble universes. But that's bad because if you sporadically cough out bubble universes, they can collide with each other. And when they collide with each other, the entire space-time configuration is shaking like a jello, which is very bad for life forms in all those universes. So what's the point? If you need fine-tuning for the multiverse, all you've done is move the fine-tuning problem back one step from our universe now to the multiverse. We're not progressing much. And one might ask, where did the multiverse get that highly, highly improbable low entropy and fine-tuning for the ordered array of the manufacture of the bubble universes? I rest my case. The point I'm trying to get to is, when you put together all three of these kinds of evidence, first, the space-time geometry proofs, particularly the 2003 Border of Lincoln and Guth proof, which shows an absolute beginning of physical reality, and you put it together with the entropy evidence, which also shows a beginning of physical reality, and then you put it together with all those anthropic coincidences, then the anthropic coincidences, namely, that, that imply a supernatural intelligence that's selecting the constants uh, you know, that we're dealing with, that seems to be more and more and more probable. And as it seems more and more probable, then for all intents and purposes, it coincides more and more with that creator that's beyond the nothingness of physical reality that throws the universe into existence at once. It's called mutual corroboration. The, the beginning implying the creation corroborates the supernatural design hypothesis, namely that the creator was really smart, highly intelligent. I leave you with the words of uh, Fred Hoyle, who put it this way. Uh, Fred Hoyle, by the way, used to be the gadfly of, of uh, physics. He, he was kind of this atheist that was always kind of fluttering around. And, and one day, uh, uh, his partner, William Fowler, came to him and just indicated to him what the improbability of the resonance levels of carbon and beryllium and oxygen and helium, that are, you need them to be exactly what they are in order to have an abundance of carbon for life forms in the universe. And really shocked Hoyle. And he went into his office, he came out a few days later, and this is basically what he said. I consider the following to be beyond the shadow of a doubt. I do not think that there are any blind forces worth speaking about. It seems to me that there must be some super calculating, super intellect, which has monkeyed with the constants of physics and the constants of chemistry and biology as well. I consider this to be beyond doubt. He stopped being an atheist on the basis of the anthropic coincidences. Let me just get to a fourth kind of evidence. But I think right now, you're getting the point. This is a very special time to be alive if you want evidence for God and creation from physics. But there is a fourth set of evidence which is slightly different from all the physics we've been talking about. Let's just call it near-death experiences. I'm just gonna give you a quick definition of clinical death, and then what I want to do is talk about four major studies and then four kinds of evidence for the survival of human consciousness after death. And I want you to put that together with the other three, evidence, three kinds of evidence we've been looking at for a beginning of the universe and the intelligence of the creator. First, what is clinical death? Clinical death is a complete absence of electromagnetic activity in the cerebral cortex, as measured by a flat EEG electroencephalogram, and in the lower brain, as measured by fixed and dilated pupils 
and no gag reflex. In other words, no electrical activity in the brain equals death. Your brain is not doing anything. You need electrical activity for the brain to function, for nerves to function, and to be attentive and aware and sensing and feeling and even thinking. So far, so good? Now, there are four studies I just want to go through with you that actually looked at this state where people were clinically dead. Maybe they were clinically dead because there was a drowning or maybe cardiac arrest. And later these people were resuscitated, but during the time they were dead, there was no electrical activity in the brain. Now, a significant percentage of these people had what was called near-death experiences. But a significant and even greater percentage of the people did not have a near-death experience of those who were clinically dead and resuscitated. Now, here's the thing you want to say. Is if a near-death experience is produced by the shutdown of the brain, in other words, a physiological explanation, and it is not only produced by, but uh, is produced by shutdown, or was produced by morphine, or some other pharmaceutical that was induced at the time to help the patient, or was induced by the resuscitation procedure, then if 100% of the people experiencing clinical death all had a shutdown of the brain, and all of them had some form of pharmaceuticals induced when compared to control groups, and all of them uh, had resuscitation performed on them in some manner, then why did only a few percent of them, like 20 to 25 percent, have near-death experiences, and the other 75 percent didn't? Doesn't look like it's produced physiologically. But let's go deeper into the evidence. We're going to talk about four studies, four kinds of evidence that would suggest that nothing physical produced it at all. In fact, that human self-consciousness actually survived bodily death, that human self-consciousness left the body like a soul leaving the body, literally, and was able to observe everything that was going on in the hospital room and beyond it. And point of fact, this state of self-consciousness had perceptive ability. As we'll see in a moment, blind people see for the first time in clinical death and then lose their sight again when they're resuscitated. Shucks. Number two, there's veridical evidence out there, verifiable evidence after the fact, measurable death anxiety that is absent from people who have undergone near-death experiences, etc. What are the studies? Number one is the Pim von Lommel study. Dr. Pim von Lommel did a very protracted study in many European hospitals, mostly in the Netherlands, over the course of literally hundreds and hundreds of patients with four of his colleagues and, and published those results in 2001 in a peer-reviewed medical journal called The Lancet. This is a very important study, and of course you can get th this information right off the website, www.modjustreasonfaith.org. All this stuff is, is there for you, the bibliography and so forth. Uh, by the way, interviews with uh, Dr. Von Lommel are also there. Number two, second study is the Kenneth Ring study. Of, uh, Dr. Kenneth Ring studied blind people who could actually see after clinical death. Number three is the Mel Dr. Melvin Moore study, which was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association's uh, uh, Journal of Diseases for Children, and two separate articles where he measured the death anxiety of kids who had undergone near-death experiences versus those who did not. And then finally, of course, the fourth, the huge Gallup poll that was done over millions of Americans who had also measured what are the kinds of characteristics that took place. You can get all these uh, sources and so forth if you just go to the website modjustreasonfaith.org and you just click on other resources, you'll see a whole section devoted to near-death experiences. Okay, let's get right down to it. So what's the evidence that goes beyond just the fact 
that everybody doesn't have a near-death experience who undergoes clinical death. Number one, veridical evidence. When people having near-death experiences leave their body, frequently enough they are close by their body and they can see everything and hear everything that's going on around them. But not only everything that's going on around them, they can also see and hear unique things that are far beyond where their body is. For example, one fellow just says, well, you know, as I left my body, I, I just went right through the walls of the hospital. And as I was out there, I noticed on the fifth floor, there is a sneaker out there on the ledge. It was really filthy. Probably had been out there for years. So this researcher literally crawls out on the fifth floor ledge. Sure enough, there is a sneaker there which some construction worker had probably dropped during the construction of the building years and years before. But that guy saw it. Or, you know, people are looking around, we're sorry, Mr. So-and-so, we lost your dentures. Ah, don't worry about it, I know exactly where they are. You know, uh, the nurse put it underneath this machine. I saw her do it during the resuscitation procedure. She took them out of my mouth and it landed up right under a machine that looks just like this. They go down to the OR, sure enough, there are the dentures. You know, I mean, time after time, I mean, there are literally thousands of verifiable, unique events after the fact that patients correctly recalled. It is impossible to deny that something is going on. I mean, there's a crack in the light fixture at the other end of the OR. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. They go down there, there it is. You know, the guy passes through the walls and goes into the waiting room. Hey, you were wearing my striped T-shirt, and you were talking badly about me. And sure enough, he was wearing the striped T-shirt, and he was talking badly about him, able to respond to exactly what the words were. Don't speak badly about the dead. Okay. <laughs> now, the key thing, of course, is there's something going on there. And it has to be reconciled. You just can't simply say, this is all attributable to the shutdown of the brain. Are you kidding me? Do you know the odds of predicting these unique events occurring by pure chance? You get the point. There's too much evidence. There are thousands of cases of this veridical, that is to say verifiable after the fact, unique incidents like sneakers on ledges. Thousands of these cases which have to be explained and simply cannot be explained if human self-consciousness does not have perceptive ability and is not surviving bodily death, it can't be explained. Number two, the Kenneth Ring study. 80% of blind people see for the first time, many of them, most of them, for the first time when they are clinically dead, when there's no electrical activity in their brains whatsoever. In fact, it's so unique for them to be seeing, they don't even have any words to describe how it looks. They just know I'm seeing, right? And of course, for the first time, they see a color and they know what it means. And, and, and of course, they're, they're looking at that and of course they come back into their bodies and they're blind again. But the interesting thing is they too could report veridical data, unique occurrences that are verifiable after the fact. How did the blind guy see what was going on over here, which was a, a unique and non-repeatable event. I mean, Pim von Lummel just asked the rhetorical question. If you can explain this, this cannot be done by physical causation. Something's going on with human beings. Number three, Melvin Morse did a study of little kids. Basically, he tested these kids with kind of an adapted polygraph which enabled him to measure the death anxiety, the nervous response of kids to you know, uh, death anxiety. Now, if a kid was clinically dead but did not have a near-death experience, the death anxiety was much higher than the normal population. If a kid was clinically dead and did have a near-death experience, then, of course, the death anxiety was next to nothing. The absence of death anxiety, he kept testing it right into the adulthood of all of these kids. 30 years or 20 years later, the same report. No death anxiety as measured by Morse's team. 
How do you explain this? How do you explain this? Fourth thing. When uh, people die, you know, they not only stay around and look around what's going on at the hospital room or outside the hospital room, they go to the other side. And frequently enough, they see a loving white light, or they see Jesus, or they see deceased relatives. The best part is what Melvin Morse discovers, right, with the little kids who, dece- who see the deceased relatives, or the little kids who are not Christians who see Jesus. Of course, they say, well, how did you know that it was Jesus if you're not a Christian? He told me. Oh, okay. Uh, And I also saw, you know, Aunt Sue. Well, how did you know you had an Aunt Sue? She died 40 years before you were born. She told me. Well, of course, you start mounting up this evidence of these little kids who do not have an agenda. And they come back with all this evidence that they've been somewhere else and seen something, right, that, that, you know, they couldn't have known prior to the event. And you start adding all this stuff up and you put it with the blind people seeing, the absence of the death anxiety, the veridical evidence, and you start thinking to yourself, you know, there's something really weird going on over here. And it just can't be passed off by saying it's the shutdown of the brain. It's the morphine. All the people who experienced clinically de- clinical death had a shutdown of the brain. All of them had morphine. But the ones who experienced the near-death experience did things extraordinarily and came back to give veridical evidence of it. I leave you with this thought. When you put these four evidence sets together, which are really only possible from the advent of science, the space-time geometry proofs indicating a beginning of physical reality, the entropy evidence indicating a beginning of physical reality, the anthropic coincidences indicating intelligent design of of, uh, our universal constants, and of course the near-death experiences which indicate you know, that somehow human self-consciousness is not limited to this body alone, but that some kind of a soul exists that survives bodily death and can even go to another side and identify figures like deceased relatives, Jesus, and the loving white light. You put those four pieces of evidence together, and I would just say this. The evidence, not only for human transcendence, but the evidence for a transcendent entity is much more probable than anyone ever suspected. And today, if you put all four kinds of evidence together and their mutual corroboration with one another, it may be just as reasonable and responsible, if not more reasonable and responsible, to believe in God and a soul than to be a materialist and not to believe in one. Which leaves us with the question, why would scientists be atheists in the face of this evidence? And the simple answer to end this is that scientific atheism is not scientific. Scientific atheism really requires the concerted ignoring of the Board of Vilenkin and Guth proof, which many physicists do. But Vilenkin just stands defiantly against them. And this is what he said in, 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 his, in his 2006 book, you know, uh, Many Universes or Many Worlds. He says, it is said that a reasonable argument will convince, uh, that a good argument will convince a reasonable man. A- and that a proof will convince even an unreasonable one. Well, now that the proof is in place, and he's talking about the Board of Lincoln and Guth proof in 2003, now that the proof is in place, cosmologists can no longer hide behind even the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They must confront the reality of a beginning. So there has to be a concerted ignoring of this evidence, concerted ignoring of entropy with all kinds of fanciful restarts of the entropic process, even when so far against the odds it's ludicrous. 
a concerted ignoring of the anthropic coincidences, or if you admit to the anthropic coincidences, to, to, uh, to, to call the multiverse a more reasonable hypothesis than some sort of a design factor. And finally, a concerted ignoring of all of the evidence and the multiple evidence of near-death experiences, even when there's veridical evidence of the blind, a concerted ignoring of it all. Well, then why have scientific atheism? I tell you this now. It's for some other reason, which is a personal choice. Perhaps a person just prefers to be naturalistic. Okay, I prefer naturalism. But why be an atheist? Why be an atheist? You can still be an agnostic naturalist. You can be a theistic naturalist. But why atheism? Generally comes down to suffering, which is unexplained. And we as Christians better do a better job explaining that. It can also come down to sometimes people just don't want to be responsible to a moral agency outside of themselves. Sometimes people had a really bad experience with religion. Their father was mean, or their mother was very religious and mean, or maybe they think that religion did more harm than good, but they, they, somehow they have a negative experience of religion. We as Catholics, we, we need to try our best to explain that to them and, and show them what religion has done for, for the law, what religion has done for the ordering of society, what religion has done for common hospitals and common education and widows and orphans. I mean, it's just, it's just amazing. The civility, I mean, individual rights literally come from religion. But we, we need to do something better about that to, to help a people to, to kind of cross the threshold. At the end of the day, we can say one thing. Scientific atheism is not scientific. It is a personal choice for some non-scientific reason, whether it be suffering, whether it be anti-religion, whether it be not wanting to be a moral agent, uh, responsible to a moral agent outside of myself, or wanting to be God for somebody else or myself. I don't know. But at the end of the day, it is not science. Here's what Robert Jastrow, the head of NASA's, NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies, this is what he said at the end of his book, God and the Astronomers. I leave you with this quote, and I will conclude. He says, you know, the scientists unshackled themselves, essentially, from the domain of superstition, right? So scientists have taken on a methodology of, of uh, empirical observation, of measurement, of you know, strict and, and, and rigorous assembling of data, right? And he says, and they scaled the cliffs of knowledge. They came to the final precipice and pulled themselves over and found a band of theologians there awaiting them for centuries. Thank you very, very much. So as a Catholic astrophysicist, you know, when I was studying the, the telescopes, I ran into the atheist. And I use a lot of the, uh, the argumentative uh, thoughts that you had. But there was always one that always bothered me, and I always wanted to know what your thoughts on the, the atheist are. It was about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, that you can create energy at certain times where you have to keep it above on its constant. That that could create the universe. And their evidence for this was a tunnel diode, that you can do electron tunneling and a diode at a p-n junction. Yeah. So I'm just kind of wondering what your thoughts are, because it actually has some legitimate statistical variation to prove that a universe could start um, from their perspective. So I just wanted to... No, it's, it's a great question. The question was about uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and how energy can come, uh, as it were, from a, a, a false uh, uh, vacuum fluctuation, um, which would seem to allow the universe uh, uh, to start. There, there's two kinds of confusion here. Um, the first thing is, of course, energy is not coming from nothing in this condition. Energy is still coming from a quantum field. It just so happens that the energy is emerging as a, almost from a zero condition to, to energy seemingly out of nothing, but really out of a quantum condition, out of a quantum field. It's like me having a bank account, right? Um, frequently, my bank account is at zero. And I still have a bank account in which, of course, money could appear. So we don't want to confuse you know, 
uh, of this quantum mechanical, this quantum condition with nothingness. That's the first thing. The second thing is it's this very hypothesis and possibility that stands behind the multiverse theory. Because in an inflationary condition where you do have dark energy, it is possible for even bubble universes to be created from this condition in the false vacuum, right? So what about that, this multiverse? As we saw before, there are two mitigating circumstances. First, the Board of Lincoln and Guth proof requires that even that multiverse have a beginning before which the physical time of the multiverse cannot be extended, meaning that the multiverse did not exist prior to that beginning point. This cannot be explained away by the quantum aspects of the theorem. And secondly, the other thing that we do want to remember too is that that condition actually is not a state of nothing. That condition actually exists. And, and so it, it, that's what enables uh, you know, a bubble universe to spring from it. So for all intents and purposes, this is an interesting configuration. It gives rise to the possibility of a multiverse, but it does not explain the Board of Lincoln and Guth proof. You'd have to ignore the Board of Lincoln and Guth proof completely in order to make the explanation work. And secondly, it is a radical confusion of something with nothing. Um, so that's the short answer to a very, very good question from, oh, by the way, he is a, a PhD in astrophysics. Okay. Very nice to have you here today. Thank you. Um, I'm not a PhD in, in astrophysics or anything like that. I just have a, have a quick question sure. um, regarding dark matter. Yes. Um, you were talking that most of the energy in the universe is dark matter. The dark energy. Dark energy, yeah. yeah. Um, can you explain that a little bit, what yeah. that is? Has it been measured? Have we seen it? Um, yeah, we, we know it uh, through its proportionality. Um, right now, the way we know of dark energy and the way we, um, well, there's several uh, pieces of experimental evidence that we have for dark energy. Uh, but right now, there is a significant amount of evidence that the universe is accelerating today. And um, uh, I'm not going to go into that in detail right now, but there are some really great articles in Scientific American from about five years ago which explain that data very, very nicely in uh, quasi-layman's terms. Essentially, you need uh, something to accelerate the expansion of space-time beyond the normal uniform expansion. You need it in two periods. The first period is right after the Big Bang. You need a period of cool but highly accelerated expansion in order to explain the distribution of the galaxies, in order to explain mass in the galaxies, and the distribution of mass within the galaxies. You also have to have this period in order to avoid terrible things like magnetic monopoles, uh, which are easily detectable if they exist, but they don't exist. Uh, we don't have any signs of them at all. So for all intents and purposes, we need this super accelerating cool period. And it was Dr. Helen Guth that did conclude to the existence of vacuum energy or dark energy to produce this cool super accelerating period at the beginning of the universe. But we also need it at the end, of the, uh, right now, in our universe. So since 0.5 redshifts, we are assuming that the, the universe continued to accelerate in its expansion. And there's a, quite a bit of evidence for that, I, as I said, in the Scientific American articles of about five years ago, if you just look up dark energy. Number two, dark matter is very different from dark energy. Uh, dark energy interacts with the space-time field in a way that, co that uh, causes the space-time field to expand and grow rapidly. So there's a repulsive character, whereas dark matter and visible matter interact with the space-time field by collapsing the space-time field, right? So essentially, when you have um, dark matter, uh, right, it collapses the space-time field and causes what we'll call attraction, right? So it causes what used to be called an attractive force. Okay, now, 
How do we know that dark matter exists? We also know that there has to be a huge source of matter beyond visible matter, right? Because remember, visible matter is only about 4.6% of the matter and energy in our universe. But remember, <clears throat> when dark energy interacts with the space-time field between the galaxies, it's causing the space-time to stretch and grow very rapidly. The question then emerges, why don't the galaxies fly apart along with the space between the galaxies? Something has to be causing a stronger force of attraction, right, causing the, the galaxies to stay together when the space between the galaxies is flying apart. What must that be? Well, it couldn't just be visible matter, but it's partially visible matter, but visible matter too small to, to prevent the galaxies from flying apart. That's why we know there's about 23% ma uh, of dark matter. It doesn't emit energy, doesn't absorb energy, a luminescent electromagnetic radiation, right? And so it's dark, but nevertheless, it has gravitational effects which keep our galaxies together. So that's the very brief explanation. I'll just try to make it real brief, uh, Father Spencer. Sure. Um, would you like to comment on um, that? There's a bestseller book coming out right now, which is uh, Proof of Heaven. Oh. by Eden Alexander. Would yeah. you like to comment on that book? Oh, that's very good. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, yes, there, um, uh, Dr. Evan Alexander, who was a Harvard uh, neurosurgeon, uh, recently wrote a book called Proof of Heaven on the basis of his own near-death experience. The interesting thing about uh, this, you know, which kind of adds to those four major studies I just talked about, the interesting thing about his was his colleagues were monitoring him, and he was pretty much agnostic uh, about uh, such things uh, prior to his having this near-death experience. But he was being monitored by his own colleagues during the whole thing. There wasn't any physiological activity going on in his brain at all while he was in the coma state. And he basically had this near-death experience, which he explains very vividly in this book, changed his mind completely, and of course, he now not only believes in God, but believes in heaven. But it's just one instance, whereas, you know, with the Pim von Lommel study and the Ring study and the Moody studies and the Gallup studies, you know, this deals with thousands upon thousands of people. And so it's, it's very, very good uh, evidence and, and corroborative veridical evidence as well. But it's a, a really excellent book, and I think it's a bestseller right now. Maybe one last question. Thank you. Is there any physical proof that our God was the one who created it beside any other random God? Oh, good our question. Extra so in other words, being? why doesn't God need a creator, as it were? Is that what you're sort of saying? Yeah, and also, could it, couldn't it be like a different one instead of the one we believe oh, in? Oh, uh, you know, it's a good question. You know, when you're looking, it's a really good uh, question that he's asking. It's, it's two parts. Uh, why doesn't God need a creator, first of all? Uh, you know, but the universe does need a creator. Anything which has a beginning has a point prior to which it was nothing. And if it was truly nothing, then it could not have moved itself from nothing to something when it was nothing, because the only thing it could do was nothing. And that's why it needs a transcendent creator, a creator outside of itself, to move it from nothing to something. However, God doesn't have a beginning. And so, right, God is not conditioned by time. Uh, what we would say in philosophy is this. God is pure act or pure being or pure power without any intrinsic or extrinsic limitation. If God has no intrinsic or extrinsic limitation to his being or power or act, then there is no way that he could be conditioned by space, which is a contemporaneous continuum, or time, which is a non-contemporaneous conti continuum. That would be an internal restriction to this unrestricted power. So if, if God is not conditioned by time, then God's not going to have a beginning. And if God doesn't have a beginning, God doesn't have a creator. That's the first part. The universe has to have a creator. God doesn't have a creator because he's not conditioned by time, he's unrestricted power act. Second part, well, how do you know that's the Christian God or our God, as, as, or the Catholic God, if I can put it that way, as that uh, fine question was posed? 
Well, as a matter of fact, scientific evidence uh, cannot get you to the point of the Christian God. Uh, what it can do is get you to the point, as, by the way, there are many philosophical proofs for the existence of God, uh, sort of logical proofs, one that was done by Bernard Lonergan in his recent book, Insight, A Study of Human Understanding in Chapter 19, where he shows that there has to be some entity which is completely intelligible. And a completely intelligible entity would have to be an unrestricted mentative act or an unrestricted mentative power. Very close to the way you, know, you traditionally define God. Unrestricted to the power of mentation, that is to say of thinking. So you know, uh, um, that's a very fine proof. There's a metaphysical proof in my book, a contemporary metaphysical proof in chapter 3 um, that uh, takes a look at what is an unconditioned reality, that an unconditioned reality has to be absolutely simple. There's other kinds of proofs that you can get that prove that past time in any condition must be finite, so-called Kalam argument, which goes back to, uh, which also can be reduced to what's called a Hilbertian mathematical argument. Now, these are all very good proofs for the existence of God. But at the end of the day, when you take all the scientific evidence, all the evidence from the near-death experiences, all the space-time geometry proofs, the entropy evidence, the anthropic coincidences, the philosophical proofs, Lonergan's proof, the Kalam proofs, and put, mount it all up, what are you going to get to? Essentially, this is what you get to. A absolutely unique, that means one and only one, unrestricted, unconditioned, absolutely simple, pure mentative power or act, and it is the continuous creator of all else that is. That's what you're going to get. So you can get to a creator. You can even get to an unrestricted power creator. You can even get to an unrestricted power creator, which is, is, um, has no intrinsic restrictions to its mentation and no intrinsic restrictions to its being, so it's timeless and has no restriction to its thought, its thinking activity, right? And, and it's absolutely unique, and it's the continuous creator of all else that is. Now, you might ask yourself the question, well, is that a loving God or not a loving God? Does that God answer prayers? You know, Aristotle proved God's existence in the metaphysics and in the physics. When he was finished, he thought, this would be such a highly intelligent entity that it must be completely bored by human beings and would have no interest in us at all. So the proof didn't work for proving a loving God. Does he answer prayers? Science can't tell you that. Philosophy can't tell you. Uh, does he redeem suffering? Science can't tell you that. Philosophy can't tell you. The proofs can't tell you whether God loves you, redeems your suffering, answers your prayer, guides you, loves you into his heavenly kingdom, wants to give you eternal life. God will have to reveal himself to us in order for us to get those answers. And this question is a perfect question to end on. Because, of course, remember dear old St. Augustine in the Confessions, right? He's got enough philosophy to kill you. He's got enough time theory, right? This guy's so brilliant, he's coming up with the first notion of physical time. This is a brilliant guy. And he's just going crazy. He's got to the infinity of God. He's gotten to time, you know, the, the, the uh, transtemporality of God. He's gotten to the unicity of God. He's trying to reach God all by himself, and he can't do it. And thank God for St. Ambrose, because St. Ambrose comes along and says, um, uh, Saint Augustine, oh, he wasn't a saint at that time. Uh, Augustine he says, um, the proofs aren't going to do it for you. You're going to need Emmanuel. God with us. You're going to need a Jesus Christ to come down and inform you of this. So I got six questions for you, and I'll end it right here. But there's six questions you'll have to answer out of your faith. Not from a proof from science or philosophy. Number one, what is the most important and purely positive power in your life? The most creative power, the one power that can never go awry, the one power that will always result in something positive instead of something negative and can govern itself. If your answer to that question is love, then come with me to the second uh, question. 
If the most powerful, most positive, most creative power is truly love, that is to say the power that's going to enable you to, to be in a unity with somebody beyond yourself, right? If that's going to be the power, right? then can God, this creator we have been talking about, can that God be devoid of love? If love really is positive, can the unrestricted, unconditioned, pure mentative act that created everything and, and continuously holds everything in being, can that power be devoid of love? If you say, nope, love is too positive for that, I don't think God could be devoid of love, come with me to the third question. The third question is this, do you just want some love or do you want unconditional love? Before you answer that question, consider how every beloved in your life has frustrated you because they have not been perfectly responsive, perfectly understanding, perfectly forgiving, perfect meaning in life, and they began to frustrate you because they just weren't perfectly loving, and I thought they were the one. What were you looking for? A finite human conditioned beloved? Or were you looking for unconditional love? And if you were looking for unconditional love, then let's admit it, everyone. What we really desire is not just some love, but unconditional love. So if you answer the question, no, I don't want just some love, I want some unconditional love, then follow me to the next question. If what you really desire, and the only thing that will ultimately satisfy you is unconditional love, and unconditional truth, and unconditional goodness, and unconditional beauty along with it, if that's the only thing that can ultimately satisfy you, do you believe that the, that the creative power that we can prove in a philosophical or logical proof that the evidence for which shines forth from the physics of today, do you really believe that that unconditional, unrestricted, pure act, which is the constant creator of all else that is and can only be one and only one, do you believe that it could be devoid of unconditional love? If your answer to that question is no, and you say, no, I think it, it, it should have some unconditional love. Maybe it, it is unconditional love. Then I ask you a, a, a fifth question. Would unconditional love do this? Would a pure, unconditionally loving God who is an unrestricted power, who is conditioned, not conditioned by time, who is a pure mentative act, a perfect mentative act, do you think as unconditional love that that God would love you so much that he would want to come down and be with you? Do you think he would actually want to love you so much that he'd want to enter into a perfect act of empathy with you, into a perfect act of unity with you, peer to peer, face to face, so that doing the good for you was just as easy, if not easier, than doing the good for yourself? Do you think he could love you that much? Is this typical of what an unconditionally loving God would do? Would the loving God be Emmanuel by his very nature, God with us by his very nature. And if you say yes, I ask you, is Jesus the one? Is the one who rose from the dead the one? The one who preached the unconditional love of God the one? The one who told us the prodigal son parable? Is he the one? The one who died for us? Is he the one? The one who gave us the Holy Eucharist as an act of unconditional love? Is he the one? Is he the one? The one that gave us the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit who guides us in love? The Holy Spirit who guides us in power? Even miraculous powers of love? Is he the one? I, I must tell you, my, my one and only response after gauging all the evidence low these many years including the way the Spirit has moved me in my own life, I must say yes. He is the one. Jesus Christ is Emmanuel, God with us. The God of the physicists and the God of the philosophers and the God of the mathematicians is the God of Jesus Christ because unconditional love warrants it and I believe that He manifested it perfectly. Thank you so very, very much.